fellow adult collectors, welcome back. David Eon here and the lovely Miss Lady Pop Hunter behind the camera. She's hiding today. I don't know why, because she's gorgeous. <laughs> she's gorgeous. Having another open discussion with the adult nostalgia community, if you will. A part of our fading nostalgia or whatever happened to kind of series. And this one is talking about the death of franchises. Now this is a, a cartoon and some of you maybe have seen this like on Instagram or Facebook or something like that if you use those platforms. And it's a row of doors with names on them and there's blood coming from under the doors and it's death and he's knocking on a new door. And on the doors they have Star Wars, Star Trek, Lord of the Rings, you know, He-Man, whatever. Implying, of course, that these fr franchises are being killed. They're being killed by the franchise owners or the people that they're allowing to write for them. We're watching one franchise after another. Beloved franchises, because these are very nostalgic for people. People who are seeking that pop culture that they grew up with. Watching franchises that they are very familiar with or that touch them in some way. Basically being ruined being ruined one after the other because of poor writing, because of the infusing of agendas, um, a variety of reasons. And th it, it poses the question, what the hell is going on? What's happening with this? Because we've seen this. We've seen it, especially if Disney's got their hands in it. <laughs> they will kill it. Um, we've seen it happen with Star Wars. The new trilogy. Oh, Disney took over. Oh, they're going to do great things. Yeah. They're hanging by a thread with Mandalorian and the hopes that Obi-Wan won't be a bad uh, television show. Which, uh, and that bothers me also now that shows are eight, six or eight episodes. You mm -hmm. know, because when, yeah, when we grew up, a season was anywhere from 24 to 36 episodes for one year. You know, and there was a format for that. There was a reason. But um, now it's like six, eight episodes is a season and they throw them all out at once and it's like, what the hell is this? But they're hanging by a thread with Mandalorian. Star Trek is completely washed out. Uh, Lord of the Rings uh, just took a major beating. The fans are pissed off. And, you know, uh, Masters of the Universe took mm -hmm. a beating. The last real love letter to Masters of the Universe fans was pretty much 200X. Um, a lot of people feel that recent attempts you know kevin smith right mm -hmm. you know had an involvement in that recent attempts were pretty much ruined there are some people that liked it but for every person that liked it there were two or three that didn't uh, they felt like the franchise was uh was cheapened even in children's storytelling look at the peter rabbit or the paddington bear films they're terrible they are terrible parodies of the original uh children's books which i read as a child you know, and I'm looking at that, I'm like, what is this? All they did was take a name and an image and just run with it and do something entirely different. People are kind of tired of seeing that. They're tired of seeing something that meant so much to them, especially growing up. One that really hurts my feelings is Sesame Street. Yeah. I'm very nostalgic for classic Sesame Street. Sesame Street was really well done. But of course, that is up until Jim Henson died. When Jim Henson died in Disney, there it is again, took took over they bastardized it they turned the Muppets and Sesame Street into basically prostitutes and ruined the formats they did they hoard them out for <laughs> uh, for profit and so what's wrong what is going on here the problem is that these are not really or were not really just franchises they were cultural phenomenons uh, Wrap your mind around that concept for a minute. Star Wars, when it came out, was a labor of love. And you could feel it. The original trilogy is, still is and probably always will be the best trilogy. Because a lot of heart and soul was poured into it. It wasn't viewed as a franchise. Um, McDonald's. Do you remember uh, the magic of McDonald's growing up? Yeah, and even in the commercials you felt yeah, it. Yeah, even in the commercials you felt it. The whole 
the whole ambiance of the, the idea of McDonald's and being a child. It meant something. Not anymore. It doesn't matter now. No one cares. Um, video games. The, uh, people still play video games, but it's not a cultural phenomenon anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, when Atari first came out, and then you had... Uh, I really think that from PlayStation on, it just died. You know, you had the Atari uh, in television, which m most people don't remember very well. There was stuff before Atari, but Atari was the first one to get the home console system idea right. Um, Nintendo culture, uh, Sega Genesis culture... There was a culture for it because it was a cultural phenomenon. Pokemon, when it first came out, was a cultural phenomenon. Is it still? You know, we, we watch things that were cultural phenomenons being reduced to a franchise. I mean, I know they're a franchise anyway, but it was more than that. Hell, even breakfast cereal was a cultural phenomenon. Is it now, or is it just an aisle full of selections? <laughs> it's not the same anymore. To modern companies and people who control those IPs, all it is is a franchise. And how can we market this? How much money can we make out of it? How much merchandising can we push out? I mean, how many Black Series Star Wars figures do you need? Honestly. And does that really fill that nostalgic gap? Will you ever have anything like the original trilogy again? Although some people, they kind of felt it in Mandalorian. I have not seen Mandalorian. Um, but for the most part, what I have heard is, yeah, you kind of get that feeling again watching it because the person who did Mandalorian, who was writing it, meant it. And as a good example, and I brought this up before, is Star Trek. Um, Star Trek also was a cultural phenomenon, the original 60s Star Trek. So much so that when Paramount was looking for something to mirror Star Wars popularity in 1978, 1979, they said, what do we have? Hey, a lot of people still really love the original Star Trek. So they did Star Trek, the motion picture, which was written really, and it's a slow-paced film, but it's really written as a love letter to the films, and it really feels like a motion picture rather than a television show a big mistake that and I know I'm trailing a little bit Star Trek the next generation when they transitioned into films they missed the mark there because the films still feel like you're watching the show but um, Star Trek the motion picture was a one-shot deal they thought they'd never be doing anything again but it was really well received by the audience Hey, can we make another one? And here's where I'm going to tie it into what I was talking about with the Mandalorian writer. When they were coming up with a concept for a second film, the, the lead on that never saw Star Trek. He didn't know anything about Star Trek. He went and watched every episode of the original series to feel it out. And the one that stood out for him was the one about the Botany Bay with Ricardo Maltabon, Khan. And he was like, wow, it would be great if I could bring this character back. I bet I could really tie these together. He really meant it when he wrote that. And you felt it. And that movie, the best Star Trek film, in my opinion, ever done, was so well done and so well received by the audience that it rekindled the Star Trek universe. The next generation happened because Khan did, uh, the Star Trek of the Wrath of Khan did so well in the theaters. That's why they came up with Star Trek The Next Generation. And so on. You wouldn't have had any of those shows, Deep Space Nine, Voyager, none of them would have happened if Khan, if that writer didn't care enough to make that movie good. But nowadays, they don't. They don't care enough to make the show good, the movie good. They're trying to make a point. They're trying to, uh, they're trying to shock people. They're trying to franchise things. A good example of trying to push the merchandising franchising, if you've ever had the displeasure of having seen the original 1989 Swamp Thing cartoon. This was written, and I know a lot of cartoons were written to sell toys, okay? But you could write a cartoon to sell toys and have it be a good damn cartoon. Have it be a good show, have it be fun to watch. You know, like G.I. Joe was fun to watch. 
You know what I mean? Smurfs was fun to watch. Swamp Thing, not so much. Swamp Thing, where they crammed every single action figure, toy, and playset into the very first episode and just slammed it together. The writing was terrible. The artwork was terrible. It only lasted, what, five shows? I think it was five shows. Yeah, five and shows. And every character was in that first episode. Yeah, they, they slammed it all in there. And when the toys didn't sell, they canceled the show, which is usually how it went in those days. There was no heart in it. Masters of the Universe, very well written uh, cartoon series uh, from Filmation. This is the reason why adults today in our age category still love that original show, still want to collect the, the, uh, the toys and action figures and other merchandise from that era. But now, just like with that Swamp Thing, they crank the stuff out with the intention of the franchising. And again, um, shows like Masters of the Universe was done. Why? Because Mattel was trying to sell action figures. So they did the show, but they put a lot into that show. A lot into the animation, a lot into the writing, even the coloring. The color, colors on that show were very vibrant. The music, a lot of heart went into it. G.I. Joe, really pay attention to the incidental music. They had That was a full orchestra, and they did I don't know how many songs. Uh, how many different uh, musical scores for that show. A lot of effort went into it. Um, but you're taking these old franchises and just taking the names and appearances of characters now and looking at them only as franchises without putting any, any heart in it. You don't care. Can I make money off this? Oh, and let me slide a couple of little political points in there that I have personally. And people will make the argument, oh, well, there's always been like political and social points in, uh, in TV shows and, and cartoons and stuff. Don't be too sure of that statement. That's something a lot of people like to say. Show me the, uh, the political statement in Gilligan's Island. Show me the political statement in Dukes of Hazard, and so on. Uh, show me the hell show me political or social statements in Dallas um LPH loves watching Dallas they had some social issues but in they Dallas. leave it neutral they do leave it neutral they bring it up and, and yeah. they just it's mention not, and present it it's not one sided they yeah. they do it in a way that presents both sides of the argument not just one yeah there is no one right answer and then they leave it alone it, it, you know that's kind of what i mean like when uh, was it pam she was talking about, I think I need to have an abortion yeah. because she has a, uh, a disease and she's afraid the child will have it. Mm -hmm. And her brother, she gives her arguments for why she thinks she should. Her brother gives his, ar her, his arguments why it's a bad idea. Yeah. But then they never touch it again. Yeah, she they, didn't, they left She it didn't have an abortion. She actually had an accident and had a miscarriage. So they did that to avoid presenting an, an answer to the audience. Yeah, and then they had a little gay episode. Mm -hmm. which they presented the guy as gay. They talked about that, and that was the end of the mm -hmm. episode. That was the end of that they conversation. They didn't tell you if it was right or wrong. Yeah. They didn't push the agenda one way or the other. Yeah, they just presented it to and you. And that's kind of how it used to be done. Now it's like, this is the right way, and you must agree. And they sh they just jam it down your throat, and often in a format that's inappropriate, Cause, uh, if, especially if it's a show for children, I don't think that uh, that uh, sexuality should be demonstrated in children's programming. Yeah. But um, now they, they force those agendas in. They do bad storytelling. I know that th they're uh, creatively bankrupt for ideas. And that's really... Yeah. ...don't have to be the case. Because it doesn't. if you do a call... Of and ask people, hey, can, do you have any ideas? People have ideas. Draw on the fans from that franchise. Yeah. They will tell you what works and what doesn't, if you care. But I also think the problem is, too, is they know, okay, these uh, franchises worked. Yes. 20, 30, 40 years ago, they worked. Kids loved it. Um, <clears throat> now we can get those same adults to present it to their kids in a modern way. So mm -hmm. they changed the animation, 
which okay fine you upgrade the animation because we got technology okay not always look what they did to thundercats yeah but, but i'm know. just saying yeah they changed the, the animation they they um modernize it with the topics uh -huh. where the topics that were that were addressed 40 30 20 years ago was fine Mm -hmm. It was it was a neutral topic that didn't really I'm not gonna say it didn't really have meaning, but it well they were more ethical yeah rather than uh, social yeah and then parents that s see that that watched it when they were a kid say oh that was great I can let my kids watch because you know parents just put the kids in front of the TV now. They don't monitor what the kids watch. Oh, uh -huh. he man, I remember that from when I was a kid. Okay, yeah, sure, you can watch that. Yeah. Or I love Star Wars when I was a kid. Sure, you can watch that and all of this. Instead of saying, okay, we got a new generation of kids. Let's put out stuff for them, for this generation, so this generation can have something of their own, and we'll make a cartoon tv show trilogy ongoing series for this crowd yeah also part of it is because they know that the modern generation will watch it whether they like it or not mm -hmm. just to try to get something out of it and i heard a lot of that star wars fans and again i haven't seen it but the number one complaint that i heard about when they did book of boba fett mm -hmm. was the show was a yo-yo Bad episode, good episode. Bad episode, good episode. And it's like, um, so writing, it was almost like two different people were writing it. Mm -hmm. uh, the, and what, this episode was absolutely trash. I almost don't want to see it again. Next episode was better. Um, is it worth it to take that roller coaster ride with a show, hoping that the next episode might be better or make sense somehow? Mm -hmm. They know that these people are going to watch it anyway. They know that even if you hate the show, you're probably still going to run out and buy the action figures. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the problem. And as long as you're going to keep feeding into that, you're going to keep helping them to fail the system. If it does, I'd rather see it just die and fade away than and have an honorable death than keep getting resurrected and worse every time it comes back. Mm -hmm. um, and it can be done. Like I was saying, if you really listen to the fans and appreciate their input and not just cherry pick what you want out of their input but really listen to it as a whole what made this work the first time you know what would help this to continue properly and we've talked about this before and that's Cobra Kai mm -hmm. this is a show that got it right that everybody who's seen it loves it and everybody who is a fan of Karate Kid even though the first one was the best and it, it got wonky as it went on, loves it. They, and they love how they did listen to the fans and brought all of the arguments from the last few decades mm -hmm. and presented it. They got all the original people. They still bring in original people back from the movies mm -hmm. onto the show. And it's like, oh, God, they got him now. They got her now. Whatever. A, a, whoever people, everyone they can that they can get their hands on to tie in and revise their character but certain arguments like if you when and i've made this argument about uh all in the family and sanford and son you watch it when you're a kid and you think archie and fred are awful but then when you watch it as an adult you realize they were being triggered mm -hmm. by uh by mike and by oh, what was the son's name oh, lionel no. lionel lionel was the one that was the problem Mike was the one that was a problem. Lamont. 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 Yeah. Lionel, Lionel was, Lionel was on Jefferson's. Jefferson's. Jefferson's son, yeah. You mixed it up. Mm -hmm. But um, they triggered them on purpose. And it's the same thing with, uh, in a way as an adult going back and looking at the original Karate Kid. What happened? Really, Daniel was kind of the problem. He was the one that was starting mess. He's the one that kept going back to it. He's the one that was inserting himself into the situations that were none of his business, and so on. Uh, every, it's like he poisoned everything he touched. Mr. Miyagi, don't touch that tree. What does he do? Climb down the side of the mountain and get the tree, and then they take it from him and bust it up. The uh, the bonsai tree, mm -hmm. remember? Yeah. And th things like that. It was, And he didn't need the money. He was going to steal the guy's tree and sell it 
for what? For a bonsai shop that dude never wanted <laughs> in the first place and had to take it because he spent his college money on the rent, forced uh, Mr. Miyagi into that situation. He was always doing stuff like that. He was always impulsive and negative. And they took that from the fans and they worked with it and they presented you Johnny's side of it, which made a lot of sense. Yeah. You know? And then they also brought in a new crowd because you... you the, yeah, there's a younger generation yeah, in there. Yeah, the older crowd, our age, can, can remember Daniel and Johnny. Mm -hmm. And then they bring in their kids to reach the younger crowd. So now we can introduce this show mm -hmm. to a younger crowd by putting their kids into it. And that's how you tie in stuff. And then you can go and, even, and watch the film, watch the original movie, which we did. We went back and watched the original movies to, you know, remind ourselves mm -hmm. because it does tie in. The references all make sense. It can be done. Yeah, it with can any be of done. these franchises. You don't just take a name and a likeness and then do whatever the hell you want. Snake Eyes is a great example of oh, that. God. We yeah. saw that movie just recently. Extremely disappointing what they did with the writing in that. Well, what they did with the character, because you took mm -hmm. a known character who's been around since who knows when. Since the early 80s. Since yeah. the early yeah. 80s. And in the 80s, you established his personality, um, his ethics, his morals. Yes. And everybody knows Snake Eyes for this, being loyal, being ethical, being trustworthy, being a person you can depend on. And then you make a movie about him, and he's none of that. Yeah. He was awful. Everything in that film was his fault. Yeah. Except for his daddy getting killed. That's true. But outside of that... But, I mean, they did, uh, we talked about this before, why do they keep making these movies and TV shows with these known characters when in the comic book you have characters they've never, ever never seen presented the to you before. And you can make a brand new show to, to reach a brand new audience and an older crowd by taking these establish characters out of the book and starting something new. You don't have to keep going over Superman and Batman and uh, what's that, Spider-Man and <laughs> all of them. Every year you make a new movie telling the same thing. Yeah. And you have characters that you never address. That before. was one of the biggest concerns with people when the Batman came out with Patterson. It was, they were it like, was oh, mine. Please don't let it be another origin story. Yeah, but and it wasn't. It wasn't. It and wasn't. I think that, that helped. Okay, because we already know, everyone knows the story by now. Yeah. So they just, they brought him in year two. Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, so everybody there knows who he is. This has been going on. We get it. Mm -hmm. Um. And it can be done where you can take a classic character and run with it and really make it work. And the, the original, before Netflix, went absolutely batshit crazy um, and, can, and canceled all of their Marvel shows. Mm -hmm. They had established that. You had The Punisher, who's been done on film, but that version of The Punisher was really well done. Mm -hmm. The only complaint anyone had was that he wasn't tall enough, but that's... Who cares? That yeah, dude played that He played part. that. He, he had the character down. Um, Luke, Cage, Luke Cage, which you've never good. seen on film anywhere, and that was one of their better shows. Mm -hmm. Luke Cage, uh, I didn't care for um, Iron Fist. I think they screwed that up. Yeah, da um, da da uh, Daredevil. Daredevil was really good. Mm -hmm. A lot of people argue that's the best of the of the four of them, and yeah. then Jessica Jones. But I didn't see Jessica Jones. Yeah. But I, I heard it was all right in the beginning, but then it got weird. But um, but still, there's an established uh, a vintage character, mm -hmm. uh, Luke Cage, and they brought him uh, they brought him on, and the show was well done. Yeah, I, I enjoyed that show. Yeah, they had some good topics. Mm -hmm. they, they they addressed an issue for a season. The second season was a whole new issue that they had to address, but it still tied in. Yeah, and the whole worked. season was one story. Yeah. Which is always good when they do it that way. Mm -hmm. But they, they, shown, they had showed with at least those three shows, because leaving out Jessica Jones and Iron Fist, again, I didn't see Jessica Jones and Iron Fist, they missed the mark. They really missed the mark. Yeah, I just got on my nerve. I had to quit yeah. watching it. 
Yeah, well, they even made fun of it in the in the show. Remember mm -hmm. the old I forget her name. The old Chinese lady was like, you know, you are the worst Iron Fist I have ever I've ever met. <laughs> you really don't know what you're doing. Uh, <laughs> but um, but those three shows, I mean, three out of five. That's not a bad track history for for those. But then and, and again, of course, you go over to the DC shows. First season of every one of them is fine, and then it turns to shit. Yeah. Uh, I can't wa I couldn't watch them anymore, but um, it can be done. Mm -hmm. It can be done if they pay attention to the fans, if they research what made it so good in the first place, and they care enough with the writing and the casting. Mm -hmm. It can totally be freaking done, but they don't care. All they see is the dollar sign aspect of it. Can we make money out of this again? Hmm. Any thoughts, people, around the table? How can we make money out of this again? And that's how it how it goes. Boardroom level. Who gets that <laughs> reference? I try it like this. Uh, at the boardroom level. <laughs> <laughs> that's are you being served, folks? That yeah, was Mr. Old Rumble. Jug ears. Old jug ears. <laughs> that dude ears were gigantic. His head was huge. His head. He he, he was he was a, a funny character. And if he maybe he he did give the impression of like upper management, half ass listening to everything that you said. But uh hmm. it can be done. But they don't care to. How much money can we make out of this? How much do we need to put in this without making a real investment? Who can we get cheap? Um, how much merchandising can we sell, yeah. you know, which is George Lucas's fault, but, uh, <laughs> that's another story. Well, because, um, they, they were so, they lacked so much confidence in the Star Wars, uh, story that they let Lucas keep toy franchising rights. Mm -hmm. And he made so much from the toys through Kenner that he pretty much funded Empire by himself. Mm without having to worry about the producers. Um, if I remember that, I, I saw a documentary on it, if I remember that, how that went properly. But, you know, that that's why you saw an explosion at that time period of movie and television uh, action figure franchising, because nobody really invested that much effort in it before. Mm -hmm. You know, nobody was willing to take it that big of a chance. And we're seeing this in all walks of, uh, of life, by the way, not just movies and television. Not just in toys, comic books. I mean, everywhere. Hell, even the commercials don't have the same feel. Nothing feels the same anymore because they only care about what they can make out of it. And there's no heart for the concept that it was at one time a cultural phenomenon. It had an impact that resonated from the childhood of these people all the way to now. And that means nothing to them. No. Unfortunately, it means nothing to them. But I'll, you know, I'll throw that back out there, of course. Hey, guys, what do you think? What do you think about uh, what we said here today? You agree? You disagree? Let me know what your thoughts are in the comments section down below. You know, give the video a thumbs up if you got something out of it. We hope that you did. Take a look at some of the other videos for other discussions, other topics, other things that we do here in the Open By Chance Nostalgia Museum. <laughs> and if that's it, then what more can I say but thanks for watching and we will see you again soon.